Last week, The New Yorker released this essay titled The Case Against Travel. And in these seven pages, the author basically tries to make a case that maybe we shouldn't travel, that maybe we hold travel in too high regards, and um, maybe we should all just stay at home. And so in this video, I'm going to respond to this article in my video essay titled The Case Against the case against travel. And I, I don't usually do a lot of response videos, but I really felt like this essay needed one. And so I've picked some selected quotes and sections that we're gonna go through here. Uh, and I'll talk about what I think about them coming from a travel expert. I feel like the person who wrote this essay doesn't like travel very much. That's what I think. And so the first paragraph right here on this essay, front page, right here, you can see it. It says, what is the most uninformative statement that people are inclined to make? My nominee would be, I love to travel. This phrase tells you very little about a person because nearly everyone likes to travel and yet people say it because for some reason they pride themselves both on having traveled and on the fact that they look forward to doing so. Now, I think for me, like hearing that somebody likes travel actually does tell me a lot about a person. It tells me that that person is curious. It tells me that that person is adventuresome. And then if I dig a little deeper and find out what type of travel do they like, whether they're a cruiser or a group traveler or a hiker or a backpacker, does tell me a lot about that individual. And well, the inverse can also tell me something. If I talk to somebody and find out that they don't like to travel, that says a lot too. I often find people who don't like to travel, they don't like adventure, they like the same, they like similarity, they like comfort in the surroundings that they know, in eating the foods that they know, in doing the things that they know, uh, or perhaps those people also don't like discomfort, which travel ultimately leads to in order to get to the great rewards uh, that travel can bring. Now, the second uh, phrase that I wanna go through, and, and yes, I've it's seven pages, and so I'm not like reading you the whole thing. I've highlighted some sections I'm gonna talk through, um, and so one might say it comes out of context, but well, it would be really boring if I read you all seven pages. So the second phrase that I wanna talk about is this one right here, where the author talks about other famous authors that also wrote about disliking travel. So we got this author here, J.K. Chesterton. He wrote that travel narrows the mind, and the good old Ralphie here called travel a fool's paradise. Those are, those are bold phrases. And, um, you know, I mean, I will say, like, there probably are types of travel that narrow the mind. And, it, you know, I, like, I'm not picking on cruisers, but, you know, I'm always um, amazed to talk to people who, like, went on a cruise and then when I talked to them about how they enjoyed the cities that they went to, it turns out they never really left the manufactured cruise port. Or I talked to somebody who went to the Bahamas and it turns out they never left the single resort they were staying at. And so I could see how those types of like completely manufactured things, people might say narrow the mind, but I think travel done right uh, expands your mind and I think travel done right is is not a fool's paradise. Um, so the third thing here, um, this is another author that she references. This is a Portuguese writer and he goes on to say, I abhor new ways of life and unfamiliar places. The idea of traveling nauseates me. Ah, let those who don't exist travel. Travel is for those who cannot feel only extreme poverty of the imagination justifies having to move around to feel. This is an interesting one, and I think that there is certainly a case for people who travel for experiences and somehow think they can't experience life in their own town or city. I mean, I'm also always amazed to find people who've been to Paris to the Eiffel Tower and New York to Times Square, but didn't know about an interesting hike or restaurant that was just nearby their house. Making these travel guides, I get a lot of people in cities who they, who say things like, Chris, you you told me something about my city I didn't know. And honestly, I, like, I consider that an honor to be able to do that. Um, but I think that that's just one to like, we don't have to go 
to the Las Vegas Strip every time to have an adventure. Or Disneyland, there are adventures in our backyard. And that was certainly something that like COVID taught me is on this channel, I had to pivot to a lot of local adventures. And there were a lot of people that were interested in the beaches of Orange County and San Clemente and a lot of interesting things to make here. They don't always have to be travels in far fung, far fung, far flung places like Japan. Uh, in the chat, uh, I see Cottage Full of Love says, I do not like whoever wrote this, not agreeing with anything from this article. That was about how I felt when I read it, which is why I'm like, I have to, I have to respond to this article. Actually, I do have to give credit to OC Girl. She was the first one who read it as we were driving in the car someplace. And she was like, oh my gosh, you have to read this. Um, you'll hate it, which I do. And so here we go with this video. All right, the um, next paragraph here in this essay, uh, these are now her quotes. These are now not quotes of other uh, authors. The author of this essay says, at home or abroad, one tends to avoid touristy activities because tourism is what we call traveling when other people are doing it. Wow, and I think that's a that's an interesting phrase, right? Like, tourism is what other people do. But we're, we're never tourists. But actually, I this is where like I, I disagree with both these statements. I disagree with the first one, that at home or abroad, one tends to avoid touristy activities. And I, you know what? I like touristy activities. I mean, I don't like, there are things that are, you're like, wow, this is definitely too manufactured tourism or not even manufactured tourism because like Disneyland is amazingly manufactured tourism that I will go back to Disneyland or theme parks again and again, right? Like the touristy things that we don't like are the places that have cheap souvenirs, the, all the same ones that all came from China, right? Like things that are like, ah, how did this place become like this? Um, but then the notion of like tourism is what we call traveling when other people are doing it. You know, I, I guess this is where the phrase like travel like a local comes from, or, you know, even to say, I'm not a tourist, I'm a local, I'm an explorer. That's why I like the phrase explore to say it's different than just taking a bus tour around or different than just taking check in the block travel. But back on touristy activities, um, you know, I think like a, like a funny story about looking for things that people want to go to. The reason why I like touristy attractions is because if a lot of people want to go there, there's probably something to be seen there. Um, and the the contrary I'll give you to this is uh, just last weekend, weekend before, Osa Girl, I, and the princess, we went to Glendora, California. What's in Glendora, California? There's a donut shop called the Donut Man, and they specialize in these strawberry donuts, and they were delicious. We went to Glendora to go get these donuts. It's about hmm, 25 miles east of downtown Los Angeles. Somebody's going to fact check me and tell me it's 19, but, you know, roughly it's it's a, you know, 45 minute drive from downtown LA to the east. And so then we're like, after we get these donuts, what should we do in Glendora? And I pull up Google Maps and I type in attractions and find there is nothing to do in Glendora. Glendora is really boring. Like there's nothing on TripAdvisor. There's nothing on Google Maps. There's just nothing any buddy wants to do in Glendora other than visit the Donut Man uh, or maybe a park. And so we went to uh, the neighboring San Gabriel Valley to find the floating teapot statue, which you might have seen my short about it, but it's this uh, floating teapot fountain in this shopping mall. And you know what? There were not hordes of tourist throngs around it, but this mall built this fountain of a teapot where the water comes up in the middle of the stream and then the water comes down to be like, we're gonna build a thing that people are gonna drive by and be like, that's cool. And if this shopping mall could build something that cool, maybe there's some interesting restaurants and shops in there. And we went to that mall on that premise and found some really tasty food to eat. Cause if they invested in a fountain that's a pouring teapot, you know, I, I like those kinds of people. So I think things that are manufactured to bring some joy and awe to our world are are nice. Why does the world have to be drab and boring? I don't think it does. All right, the next point that I wanna go on, my text got cut off on here, uh, but in this section, if we, uh, what it says right on top, the top sentence, it says, although people like to talk about their travels, and now you see it on the screen, few of us like to listen to them. Such talk resembles academic writing and reports of dreams 
forms of communication driven more by the needs of the producer than the consumer. And I thought this one was really funny as a producer of travel content, you know, as I make vlogs on my trips, and to say that nobody likes to listen to them or few of us like to listen to them. I don't know, there's uh, 91 of you on the live stream right now, and so I wonder why you all are here if nobody likes to listen to travel stories. And although this is not a story about my travel, it is definitely travel talk. Uh, but you know, I like, I will say in the evolution of Yellow Productions and of this channel, I definitely, right, took a took a mental model about these vlogs or videos I create. So they're that they're when they started, they were definitely for me. They were for me to share with my friends and family. Uh, but at some point, I'm like these videos because people are watching them. They're they're no longer for me. And what I try to produce is content that y'all can learn from my experiences or my travels to help you plan your trip to a destination or a future trip to a similar destination or just um, get some value by being entertained about uh, how this guy can eat so much food. That's what my dad always says when he watches my videos because you know, I typically travel with OC Girl and our daughter and maybe even family and friends, this and that. And so, you know, I'll have all the food in front of me to start the like scene at a restaurant. My dad's like, how can you, where does all this food come from? And of course there's like five people off camera that are gonna like help me finish all that food as soon as I'm done with the scene. Uh, but uh, Brooklyn Joe says, uh, I either listen to this or my wife. Just kidding. Ha ha ha. Thanks, Joe. And Cottage Full of Love says, I love listening to people's travels. Yeah, I think there are, like, I think other people's travels can be interesting. And I think there's also, like, um, travel talk. So it's really different than my channel. My channel is, like, I'm trying to help you in the places that I've been to. But, you know, there are people that we watch that are, like, Oh, this person went someplace that I'm never going to go. I'm never going to go to this place. And the only way that I'm ever going to experience this is like by watching this person's video. You know, I don't watch a lot of Mr. Beast videos, but I watch the video where Mr. Beast went to Antarctica because I'm probably never going to go to Antarctica. And it was interesting to see his like 24 hours or something like that on Antarctica. And uh, Explore says, I watch Yellow Production shows before I travel to get the best advice, then decide if it's worth the time and money. Thank you so much. My pleasure, Explore. Uh, and that's another thing I think we can learn by watching other people's travels. We're like, do we want to go there? Does that even look interesting to me? Um, so this is uh, where the author really starts to get into the like argument against travel and saying right here that one... Um, so she's making the counterpoint of this, but she's stating it in the positive, saying that one com common argument for travel is that it lifts us into an enlightened state, educating us about the world and connecting us to its uh, citizens. Um, what I gained, so this, this author, another author, says what I gained by being in France was learning to be better satisfied with my own country. And you know what? If that's all you gain from travel, being like, oh, how do people in this part of the world live like this where I live isn't so bad? I mean, I like a decent appreciation of our home, I think is a pretty positive thing. Um, on the flip side, I think we can also learn things like places around the world do things better than my home. You know, being a, a citizen of the United States of America, we definitely have a rhetoric in this country that USA is number one and you know what? In a lot of things, the USA is number one. But in other things, in a lot of other things, the USA is not number one, like uh, public transportation, big cities, like in long distance train transport. Um, we can't even build like one high speed rail uh, and in airports like our airports are, are awful. And those are the things that I think if we when we travel and see how other people do things in other parts of the world, we're like, wow. Wouldn't it be great if I could bring that experience here? I see that so often in um, places, restaurants, shops, these sorts of things. And I, I forget where OC Girl and I were recently, but it was like, um, oh, right. It was Whistler. So in Whistler, in Vancouver, Canada, Whistler has this peak-to-peak -peak gondola. It's a you know cable car cable car ropeway that'll take you from Whistler Mountain to Blackcomb Mountain. That's this like giant expanse takes 15 minutes to go between the two in this ropeway gondola. And how did this come to be in Whistler? One of the executives of the company that like operates the ski lift 
went to Switzerland and saw in Switzerland they built things like this to connect their mountains at the top. Not just to you go bottom up, but to say like, oh, once people are on the top of the mountain, maybe they want to go between them. And so it was that person's trip to Switzerland that they're like, hey, let's do that here. Um, and so I think that is a great thing that travel can bring to us all. Uh, yeah, and Gil says, we definitely need to build more trains and trails in America, the USA in particular. Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, so like there's a great debate about the high speed rail in California. And I'm like, come on, let's build it. Have you seen the bullet trains in Japan? And I feel like the people who rail against the California high speed rail are people who have never tra taken a bullet train in Japan. And you know what? Yes, the program has its warts and things like that. And it costs a lot of money. But look, we got to start someplace. And for the people who say we should cancel it, I'm like, then we'll just all be stuck in our cars and in traffic for like the rest of our lives in California. Um, so then there's this point uh, that goes on to say, travel gets branded as an achievement. See interesting places, have interesting experiences, become interesting people. Is that what travel really is? And I mean, I think for some people, that's what travel is, right? Like some people have a checklist of places that they want to go and pictures that they want to take in front of things and that makes them happy if the, if they do that uh, particularly the chinese tours that go places like the chinese when they travel in their tour groups that's what chinese tourism is you know they get on their tour bus they come to la they get dropped off in front of uh, hollywood boulevard they file out in front of the dolby theater they take a picture in front of the dolby theater they're there for 10 minutes they get back on the bus go to the Santa Monica Pier so they can take a picture in front of the Santa Monica Pier and go on, right? And it, like, if that's what they want, fine. Um, now, I think that there certainly are like steps beyond that. Like travel can certainly go beyond um, check block travel, uh, hence the phrase travel like a local. But I think that where it just becomes this, you know, we're looking for the achievements or we're looking for the merit badges is when we're like, there's some magic agenda or there's some magic itinerary and I gotta like schedule my trip out to the 15 minutes and do these things instead of something like, hey, I'm going to this place and what am I gonna see there? I don't know. Maybe I'll figure it out when I get there. Uh, and so when we plan our trips, we, we definitely like to have interesting places, interesting experiences and tasty food that we've scheduled out. But then we also like to have days that are like, I don't know what I'm gonna do here and I'm gonna figure it out when I get to the place because I'm gonna talk to people. I'm gonna talk to the concierge. I'm gonna talk to the front desk staff. I'm gonna talk to the waiters and waitresses and be like, hey, what do you like? What should we see? What's interesting to see around here? Uh, and then kind of like fill in the margins, not just, you know, finding the lists that we found from Lonely Planet uh, to be like, these are the top things to do in a place and be like, okay, I guess that's what I'm gonna do. Uh, TP. 92128 says the longer you stay the better of the experience i i agree i mean i think that there are so many people who try to like they try to see so many places like when i hear people who go to europe and they're like in europe for two weeks and they went to like london paris frankfurt munich prague amsterdam i'm like what did you see did you see anything or did you simply spend all your time in uh trains buses and airplanes right and to get your 15 minute uh check mark travel um so this is probably the boldest, boldest statement in the article. And actually they use this as like the subtitle for the article. So the subtitle for the article, it's on the first page here. The case, the case against travel, it turns us into the worst version of ourselves while convincing us that we're at our best. Call this the traveler's delusion. Are we, are we all deluded? Are we all awful travelers? Um, and you know what? I think there are some awful travelers out there. Like there are, we've all seen them. You know, this is why the, the existence of these awful travelers is why people in Hawaii are like, we don't want tourists, tourists go away. We don't need you. Tourists are awful human beings. And I don't think they all are. I don't think all tourists or travelers are awful human beings. There certainly are those that feel entitled, that feel someone else's backyard is their playground because they've got a lot of money and they're spending their money and so they should be treated like they're a king or a queen or, or some sort of royalty. Uh, but I think 
when we travel like we live there and we talk to the people as if they're at our level. I mean, like the, the, the maids are at our level. The housekeeper, the housekeepers are at our level. The restaurant staff are at our level because frankly, they, they are. We're just like all people. You know, they've chosen different roles. We've chosen different roles. They do different things. At times, they're the ones that are traveling and being served by other people and just being like appreciative for that fact. Um, and uh, Canyon Overlook says, what percent of the Hawaiian economy is tourism? A lot. You know, there are a lot of places. And it's it's like the places that often I feel like are have the most anti-tourism sentiment tend to be the places that like their economy is like the most tourism. Now, that being said, uh, there are certainly places that aren't, right? I'll, like a, one I'll name is like Las Vegas. You know, nobody in Las Vegas, Nevada goes we should keep the tourists away because they're like, literally this city will collapse. San Diego, California is another one. To be like San Diego would collapse if the tourists stopped coming to San Diego. Um, and so there are many places that are built on that. I think the places that maybe don't like it as much are the like, you know, mountain towns that used to be really quiet and have now become overrun by tourists, right? You know, Hawaii is probably the same way. A lot of these islands or small towns were like really quiet and then they became discovered by tourists. And they're like, oh my gosh, what do we do with all these people? And I think they could like better figure out how to corral them, harvest money from them. You know, the Hawaii example that I give. And then, by the way, this is not like a, this is not like a pick on Hawaii video at all, <laughs> but it's like, Whenever I hear things like, oh, this hiking trail in Hawaii is really popular. So what have they done? They've closed it because they can't maintain it. They can't uh, secure it. There's no parking. One of them that I was like so saddened by was the stairway to heaven. And if you don't know the story of this one in Hawaii, it's this like staircase that the U.S. military built. I don't remember what branch, but it was like to maintain antennas up on the top of mountains. And so it's the... Instead of a hiking trail, it's almost like a staircase that goes on top of mountains. And basically the government closed it because too many people were trying to hike it. And people were then going in illegally. They were going in at night. Like, so many people wanted to hike this. I'd be like, if it were me, I'd be like, I'll just charge people $100 to hike this. You know, I think Sydney, Australia does it very well. Like, there's the uh, bridge in Sydney with the harbor bridge in Sydney. And you can pay, like, $200 to climb the... Um, like not on the road surface, but like on the top of it, like whatever you call those, <laughs> those things, right? Uh, probably because somebody did it illegally and they're like, you know what? Maybe we just charge people a couple hundred bucks. We can make a lot of money and get money to like maintain this bridge. I think it's a good idea. Um, and so that's how I also think localities, you know, be like, hey, these people who do feel too entitled and all this money, you know, so figure out great ways to like siphon the money off of them too. Uh, and Grant, uh, well, this, you know what I love about doing live streams is I learn new things. And so Grant looked it up and said 21% of Hawaii's economy is travel, uh, tourism, right? That's a lot. Okay. Um, so this is where like the essay starts to get like really academic and they bring up this definition of what a tourist is from this book um, that's called Hosts and guests. What is hosts and guests? Hosts and guests is the classic academic book on the anthropology of tourism. I, like, I have to go read this book now. I feel like uh, maybe it sounds dry, but I'm like, hmm, I think it might be an interesting read. And so what the book hosts and guests says, they define a tourist and they say a tourist is a temporary leisured person who voluntarily visits a place away from home for the purpose of experiencing a change. Tourists are less likely to borrow from their hosts than their hosts are from them, thus precipitating a chain of change in the host community. And then the author of the essay goes on to say, we go to experience a change, but end up inflicting change on others. I think this is, this is like an interesting one too, you know, and I mean, just thinking about like English as a language that has definitely become, um, expanded around the globe based upon the number of English speaking travelers. When English speaking travelers go to a destination, the destination needs to produce more signs and menus in English, needs to hire more people that speak English to cater to the English travelers. And then the people in that place tend to use more English because there's more English speakers. And so like, why is it that English is so spoken around the world, right? Like, I, I think it's because of that reason. It's also become like the de facto 
middle language. You know, if you're from Sweden and you're visiting Spain, you know, it's hard to get everybody to learn every single language, every single language pair, but you're like, well, if we can meet in the middle, you know, like in Europe, if we can just learn English, then we're all good. You know, Singapore is the same way, right? Like in Singapore, like everybody has a different like mother tongue and then it's like, but we'll, we'll meet in the middle uh, with English there. But I think that it's, it's for this reason where place people say places become too westernized uh, because they've, they don't retain their charm. I think it's one of the reasons why OC Girl and I uh, really like to travel to Japan. You know, Japan, a lot of tourism in Japan. Like Japan makes a lot of its um, economy off of tourism, but Japan also retains its ways, retains its traditions, the traditional Japanese hot springs, the way of eating, the way of life. And I, and then, and instead of saying like, hey, you know, I, I know Western tourists don't like to be naked with other people in the bath. Let's change it for them. You know, that's, that's not what they've done. They're like, we like it this way and people can come here if they like it this way. And like, if not, not a big deal, they can go somewhere else. Um, Michael traveling the world makes the point, uh, that Airbnb potentially makes something more local accessible. Potentially. I mean, maybe there's a place you can stay that isn't a hotel that's in, um, I don't know, you know, the middle of South Dakota or something like that, that like you can do that. Um, hello from Hawaii. Uh, Chris points out great point about Japan. Thank you very much, Chris. And I know he was in Japan just recently. Um, and I think he enjoyed a lot of those things about the, like the traditionality of it. Uh, and cottage full of love says, I wonder if this author has traveled much. Well, so they go on to talk about a trip. This author goes on to talk about a story that they had when they traveled. So this author goes on to say that uh, they took a trip to Abu Dhabi. And in Abu Dhabi, one of the like big things to do is to go to the hospital for falcons. It's a hospital for falcons. There's a lot of falcons. They like the falcons. And so this hospital treats falcons. And why, why did she go to this hospital? Well, because she said, what does one do in Abu Dhabi? And it's one of the top things to do in Abu Dhabi is to visit this falcon hospital. Uh, but then she goes on to say that, you know, it was interesting. She noticed on the wall of the lobby at this Falcon Hospital, they had a sign that said, like, like they had a, their awards posted for excellence in tourism. And she points out, keep in mind, this is an animal hospital. Um, she goes on to say, you know, why might it be bad for a place to be shaped by the people who travel there voluntarily for the purpose of experiencing a change? And the answer is that such people not only do not know what they are doing, but they don't even know what they're trying to learn. And then she says, if you're going to see something you neither value nor aspire to value, you're not doing much of anything besides locomoting or moving around. So she makes this proposal that her visit to the Falcon Hospital wasn't useful, wasn't interesting. And I, I have two points as a remark to this. Um, my, my first remark is that uh, the Falcon Hospital probably figured out the tourists are a great way for them to make money to support taking care of falcons that can't pay, right? Like the public falcon, you know, it's like it's probably, I like, I don't know. I haven't really lived in this hospital, but it makes sense to me to be like, hey, let's get a lot of tourists to come here to pay us to do this so that we can continue our outreach mission to treat falcons. Um, but the other thing that I think about this is that like, I mean, is it bad for us to go places to see a thing that we we don't know that we're gonna like. I mean, how do you know you don't like art if you never go to museums? How do you know you don't like sushi if you never eat sushi? I mean, 20 years ago, if you would have asked me, Chris, do you like sushi? I'd be like, no, I hate it. I hate sushi. And then I ate at uh, one particular sushi restaurant in Tokyo, Sushi Show, and I, it, cha it changed my life. I was like, I like sushi now. I, I legitimately like sushi after this one experience because now I understand what sushi actually is and I understand that everything I've ever had before was in fact not sushi. Um, and so I think that part of like, there, there is a part of travel to be like, I don't, I don't even know that I'm gonna go like this experience, but if this is a thing in this place and, and these people like it, a lot of them do, maybe I will. I just don't know enough about it to know that I could even 
like it. Uh, and uh, John says that, uh, yes, they had to get money from the tourists at the Falcon Hospital because Falcons are notoriously cheap. I've heard, yeah, they don't, they don't pay their hospital bills, right? They just, they just fly out, they get treated, and they just fly right out of the hospital. Um, and uh, Michael, Michael Traveling the World says, uh, don't just blindly follow the tourist party line. Going to India isn't Michael's thing right now, so he goes to Europe instead. Do what you want. For sure. Um, and you know, I also think there's another one about like experiencing things that we might not like. Uh, you know, I tell the story about this that you may have heard before when Osi Girl and I went to Korea, hosted by the South Korean Tourism Board, and they set up a temple stay at a overnight at a Korean Buddhist temple for these eight YouTubers on this trip. The tour guide was like I'm not going to tell you much about it. Just dive in. <laughs> Just know that it's not not going to be like this hotel. It's not going to be like things you've been before. But just go in with an open mind, and you know what? You'll you'll be fine in the morning. Of course, what she didn't tell us is that the, you know, the the monks are going to wake us up, ringing the bell at four in the morning. But it was like it was a super interesting, enlightening, and educational experience about the life of a monk in a Korean monastery. A Korean temp, Korean Buddhist temple that we would not have had if we just didn't go like, you know what? Let's give it a go. <laughs> Let's spend the night in the temple instead of the Park Hyatt. I'm thirsty. What have I been drinking today? Today I am drinking peach tea by Galvanina. Hmm. Mm. Too sweet too sweet. The thing I often don't like about fruity teas is they're just too much sugar in them. One of the reasons I like the brand Honest Tea, although I never drink it on the live stream, I like Honest Tea because like their phrase is like just a tad sweet. Um, <laughs> Benchland Travels says the case against travel is a case without merit. Dismissed. Gung gung. Bang the gavel. All right. Well, I have a few more points to go against. I haven't dismissed it quite yet, but you'll, you'll find out. Not a lot of things I agree with in this article. Uh, okay, so she goes on to say, uh, tourism is marked by its locomotive character. And when she says locomotive character, she means like moving around. That a big part of what you do when you travel is you go to this place, and you go to this place, and you go to this place. Um, so it's like, I went to France. But what did you do? I went to the Louvre. Okay, what did you do there? I went to see the Mona Lisa. That is before quickly moving on. And apparently many people spend just 15 seconds looking at the Mona Lisa it's locomotion all the way. And I think that this goes back to my earlier point about many people just plan too many things and they're like, okay, I need to go do that. I've done that. Now I need to move on to my next check in the blocks thing. And I will admit, I will fully admit, the first time I went to Paris, I had, uh, I didn't have much time. <laughs> I didn't have much time at all. Uh, and I had like a day to see Paris. And I was there not on a YouTube trip. Uh, I was there on a, a another trip and my free time that I had was one day in Paris and so I'm like you know my first time in Paris I'm gonna like I got those you know 24 hour everything Paris cards and I like I checked all the highlights off as quick as I could and then Osigaro and I we went back to Paris for a week and we went to the Louvre for longer and we stood in front of the Mona Lisa for longer than 15 seconds and so uh if you've only got a little time it's okay when I went to Sydney recently, you know, the zoo, the Sydney Zoo, they thought I was crazy um, because the zoo in Sydney closes at I feel like 4.30. Let's call it 4.30. Could be 4. Could be 5. I don't know. I got there 45 minutes before closing time and they wouldn't sell me an admission ticket. I'm like, I want to go in the zoo. They're like, oh, the zoo closed in 45 minutes, so we're not selling tickets anymore. I'd like to buy a ticket to go in the zoo. Oh, where the ticket booths are closed. Uh, you know, it's really expensive. Why don't you come back tomorrow? I'm like, this is the only time I have to see the zoo. I'd like to see the zoo. I'm also making a video. I'd like to put the zoo in the video. So for me, even the 45 minutes of seeing the Sydney Zoo that they all thought I was crazy on was better for me than not seeing it at all. Um, and uh, Eddie gives that same advice right there. Eddie says, my recommendation, first visit, see as much as you can. Second visit, relax in one place. I think that's a good tip. 
Daniel points out that the Mona Lisa is particularly unthrilling. The crowd around it was more interesting. I agree with you, Daniel. I, I stood in that room more to look at the people around the Mona Lisa than the Mona Lisa. And I think the reason why people just spend 15 seconds looking at the Mona Lisa is because we've all seen that painting. Like we've seen that painting so many times in prints and reproductions that like the original one just isn't isn't that mesmerizing there there is the picture that i've seen a thousand times before i've been here all right um i thought this was an interesting one and i think this one is an interesting point in our instagram world that we have today thinking of pictures and this and that so the author of the case against travel uh goes on to talk about two stories from this other essay titled the loss of the creature this essay is by Walker Percy. Walker Percy uh, tells us a story of two different travelers. We'll start with the first one here about a traveler who visits the Grand Canyon. And um, going to the Grand Canyon, everybody knows what the Grand Canyon looks like and has an image of what the Grand Canyon looks like, that it looks like this. But what happens when that traveler goes there on a day and it looks like this? It's cloudy or it's foggy. The traveler may say, ah, it's a bad day. It's a bad day. I feel cheated. I don't get to see what I came to see because what they came to see was this and not this. And I think it's very easy to let, you know, rain or weather like rain on your parade. Uh, but Osigro and I will tell you, we like we don't. You know, we're like we go to Japan and it rains half the time. But we're like, we're not going to let the rain ruin our day or our adventure or our trip. We're just going to plan things around the rain or plan things that are better to do in the rain or you know if you're in the middle of a snowstorm let's plan a snowball fight and I think that um you know maybe it's really interesting to see the Grand Canyon this way because you know for 320 days a year it's like this and so you get to see a really special one when you see the cloudy and the foggy one um he talks about another traveler a couple from Iowa uh, this couple from Iowa, they're visiting Mexico and they're driving around Mexico and they get super lost and they're in this, like they end up in this like mountain village and they find the locals are doing a dance, like a local dance and they watch the local dance. Um, but they're just, while they're there, they're unfulfilled by, uh, by the dance. But when they get home, they have a friend of theirs who's a ethnologist and they tell their friend back in Iowa the ethnologist you should have been there you would have loved this performance so much and so they go back to Mexico on another trip with the ethnologist to watch the same performance in this village except the couple from Iowa they're not watching the performance they're watching their friend the ethnologist for his reaction to see if he likes it and then if they like if the ethnologist likes it then they like it because if the ethnologist likes it that means it's authentic or it's interesting yet somehow they personally can't judge whether it's authentic or interesting they need someone else to judge it for them uh that they need him to certify their experience as genuine um and then this author uh of the essay now the case against travel goes on to respond to that to say that the tourist um often outsources their experience to other people, to postcards, to conventional wisdoms about what you are to do or not to do in a place. And then has this phrase which says, whether an experience is authentically X is precisely, precisely what you as a non-X can't judge. You know, you're not an expert. How do you know if it's authentic? And I feel like this word authentic is thrown around too much. You know, like, I want it to be authentic. This wasn't authentic. This was too Americanized, or this was too Westernized. Um, and, you know, it's like, I want, I want to go to this country, and I want something authentic. Because I, want it to, I want it to be dirty, you know, and I want to eat on the street, and I want dust in my food. And it's like, I, you know what? In Mexico, uh, there are some pretty high-end, authentic restaurants. Like, there are wealthy Mexicans and not everything has to have dirty bathrooms and be street food like there are really high-end Mexican seafood experiences too and I don't think those are unauthentic and so uh this is one where like Osigra really talked about this saying that she's a she's a food blogger she talks about food a lot and um but she isn't a chef so you know if we listen to this article she shouldn't be an expert she should really not talk about it because how does she know about what food's good? What food is authentic? And I mean, 
she knows what feels good in her tummy and what feels good on her tongue, um, even though she doesn't know, like, an in-depth knowledge of what went into, like, making it or how to make it. Um, but I also think being open to experiences, you know, I, like, for us, we don't have to go to a place that somebody says is the best of something. You know, I, my recent Singapore series is sort of funny because there's in Singapore. And maybe there's some Singaporeans watching right now. Singapore has a whole thing about in in their country, because it's very small, very small country. Don't be offended, Singapore. You know your country's small. Uh, there's like a best of everything. You know, what place has the best chicken rice? What place do you go to to have the best mee goreng? What place has the best laksa? And like people can narrow it down to like this restaurant has the best of this. And so then in the video, when I eat at someplace else, people are like, oh my gosh, how could you eat at that place? You should have eaten at this one. This one's the best. And I didn't, because I like often don't like to let um, the expert list of these are the best place to eat guide everything that I eat. There's a lot of really interesting food that I just find by ending up in a hawker center or ending up in a food court or walking down the street going like, that looks interesting. How would I go eat that? What is that? You know, I went up in Singapore. I went up to this uh, Indonesian stall in the food court in um, the Jewel at Changi. So, like, it's the mall with the waterfall in Changi Airport. The basement, there's a food court with, like, 50 stalls or something. And this Indonesian restaurant, I, like, while I've had some of the dishes that they had, Indonesian restaurants are not, in California, are not presented the way this one was. This one was presented like a like a Pan Express, like a, you know, food is on these like, not really steam table, but like these dishes out there and you kind of like tell them you get two meats and you get four veggies and there's like no signs on them. There's just the things there. And you have to be like, what's this? And what's this? And what's this? And of course then I, you know, inevitably I do the like, uh, like one of the things you can get is the combo with two meats and four vegetables. And so she's like, I'm like, I want that. And she's like, what do you want? Like, what do you want in it? What two meats and what four vegetables do you want? And I'm like, tell you what, how about you pick for me? <laughs> Just, you pick for me. Just put some things on that plate and they'll be good. And you, let me tell you, they were really good. Um, and I think we have to be open to those kind of experiences. Just go up someplace and be like, I put my, tum my, put my stomach in your hands, put something on my plate uh, that you think will make you proud of this restaurant. Mm. Hotel Productions TV points out that restaurants that have great reviews are usually good. However, comma, I agree with this statement. Uh, there is a however, comma to it. You know, like maybe the restaurants that are rated on TripAdvisor might not be that good because they're rated by people that don't really know the cuisine. I mean, I find this a lot in Southern California looking at, uh, I'll just use the example of ramen, Japanese ramen, Japanese noodle soup. If you're in... Uh, Costa Mesa, you can trust the reviews because there's a lot of people that know ramen that eat in Costa Mesa. Costa Mesa has like 100 ramen restaurants. If you're in Laguna Beach, the beach community where there's only one ramen restaurant and the people in Laguna Beach don't eat ramen much, then they're like, I love this ramen restaurant because they, they have nothing else to like base their experience on except the one that's now opened in their town. Grant says, uh, you need a however comma shirt. I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna make a however comma shirt. Thank you uh, for that grant. That's a good idea. Um, Adrian says, the only food I really enjoyed in LA this past November was soup, the pizza, not the best. Adrian, I'm curious, where are you from? What's your what's your frame of reference on pizza? But I agree with you, the birria is really good in LA and the pho, the Vietnamese noodle soup. Many people, like I've not been to Vietnam, but many people who have been to Vietnam tell me that they like the pho in Los Angeles better than the pho in Vietnam due to the um, higher quality ingredients that they can get here in California than the pho is often made with in Vietnam. All right, we're getting we're getting to the end of these points, uh, and then we'll get to Q and A. We got like four more. So uh, this phrase or this statement. Uh, she goes on to say that travel prevents us from feeling the presence of those we've traveled such great distances to be near because of, uh, I, I feel the same, because of the language barrier, um, because of the type of experience. If we're on a tour bus, if we're on a cruise ship, 
Uh, we don't meet the locals. If we're in line for the Eiffel Tower, we don't meet the locals. And I think there is something to be said for going to a destination and not interacting with the locals. When I say there's something to be said, I don't mean in a positive way. I mean that that, that happens. People do that, which I think is why it's important important if you want those things if you crave those things to like seek at activities that you can find them we we were in thailand we really enjoyed taking cooking classes because we got to interact with local thai chefs uh we enjoy taking walking tours run by locals uh rob from trip hacks dc that's often here on yellow productions tour guide in dc Grew up in D.C., you know, a great tour guide, very knowledgeable. You get to meet a local when you do it in a way that isn't, you know, the time you spent with the person at the ticket booth at the Eiffel Tower who's not very friendly. They're particularly cranky because, I mean, you would be if you were selling tickets to the Eiffel Tower, too, in a small booth. Um, and uh, Lisa points out that if you're looking for Vietnamese food, the best place you're going to find them in Southern California is in Orange County, particularly in Westminster, Garden Grove. Uh, I agree. Our favorite for pho is pho 101. Uh, that's like right on the border of Westminster and Huntington Beach. It seems like all the pho restaurants have a number after them. So I don't, I, I, I wonder, like, what is pho number? You know, there's probably some story behind that that I need to go look up. All right. Okay, this one's long. Um, so I'm going to try to read through this one quickly. Uh, but she, she says... The single most important fact about tourism is this. We already know what we'll be like when we return. A vacation is not like immigrating to a foreign country or matriculating in a university or starting a new job or falling in love. We embark on those pursuits with trepidation of one who enters a tunnel, not knowing who she'll be when she walks out. The traveler departs confident that she will come back with the same basic interests, political beliefs, and living arrangements. Travel is a boomerang. It drops you right where you started. And I... Again, I don't, I don't, don't agree with this either. This is what the timeshare industry was based on. You know, like people go to a destination and they're like, "I love this place so much, I want to come back. I like this way of life better." You know, if you um, like watch a lot of travel YouTube, uh, Lost LeBlanc, Christian, he's from Canada. You know, he went to Bali and in Indonesia, and he's like, "I love this place." And he's like, "He's moving there." Um, and like, how would he have known to move to Indonesia unless he went there first as a tourist? and then eventually as a resident. And so I think that uh, travel does change us. But then they, they, she goes on to say that, well, um, now if you think this doesn't apply to you, that your own travels are magical and profound, um, you, you can't possibly assess that in the first person. You need someone else to assess that of you. Like did, and then she says, think about your friends. The last trip that they went on, did it change them? And this is where I think that can you say that about one trip? Like this one trip changed me or this one trip changed that individual. I mean, I think that seeing the world is a whole bunch of experiences that all come together to form our opinion and our mind to make decisions years later, years down the road about something we experienced decades before. And so I think there is substantial change. You just can't look at it from, the, you know, I went to Korea and I wasn't a monk and now I am a monk, right? Um, and uh, she does give it a positive spin here. Travel is fun, so it's not mysterious that we like it. What is mysterious is why we imbue it with a vast significance and aura of virtue. If a vacation is merely the pursuit of unchanging change and embrace of nothing, why insist on its meaning? Um, and this is, we're just coming to the end here. And so uh, <clears throat> this is where she concludes this article. It's very dark. It's very dark. So she says, one is forced to conclude that maybe it isn't so easy to do nothing, and this suggests a solution to the puzzle. Imagine how your life would look if you discovered that you would never travel again. If you aren't planning a major life change, the prospect looms terrifyingly as more and more of this, and then I die. Travel splits this expanse of time into the chunk that happens before the trip and the chunk that happens after it, obscuring from view the certainty of annihilation. So basically, she says the reason that we travel is that we're afraid of thinking about death. And this is her last statement. Socrates said that philosophy is a preparation for death. For everyone else, there's travel. Wow. Okay, so I have a quote to respond with. Here's my uh, quote I enjoy from Mark Twain. Mark Twain, this is my quote, not her quote anymore. We're not talking about this paper anymore. Mark Twain says, travel is fatal to prejudice. 
bigotry and narrow-mindedness, and many of our people need it sorely on these accounts. Broad, wholesome, charitable views of men and things cannot be acquired by vegetating in one little corner of the earth all one's lifetime. So those are my thoughts. If you want to hear more about why, why I like travel, why we travel, uh, I've got a link to my whole hour live stream. I just talking about that. You'll find a link in the description below. You can watch that at the end of this video. But now we're going to do Q&A time and then it's time for the giveaway. Fellow explorers, it is now Q&A time. If you've got a question, I've got an answer. All right, fellow explorers. So are we all traveling because we're afraid of death? <laughs> I'm curious what your opinion, what have I missed? And I'm curious if you've made it to this end of the live stream. Does anybody watching this really agree with this article? And I was like, Chris, you were, how could you be so full of it? This article was so profound and uh, said everything I believe. Uh, Adrian says, uh, gotta stay positive and visit the world with your time. Uh, this is my motto. Um, and uh, Laura says, well, including myself, I call traveling to different places on a bucket list. And uh, Kaj Full of Love says, I do connect travel with hurry before I can't. That was deep and dark though. I, I agree with you with the hurry before I can't, right? And I think there are so many people that they wait so long until they can't. They wait till they retire and then they can't because they're physically unable or these sorts of things. And so I do think, you know, we just have to travel when we can. Um, Cloak Traveler says, I travel because I love life. Uh, Laura says, completely and utterly disagree with the article. Joe says, uh, I travel because of a wonderful world. Black and Paula says, Mark Twain's a genius. Grant says, the article was dumb. Yeah, I think that's why, uh, I think that's why a lot of people responding to it on Twitter and Reddit. But you know, when I searched the title of this article on YouTube, I did not find one single YouTube response. And so I hope to create the conversation here on YouTube about why travel is amazing as opposed to why we shouldn't travel. Uh, and uh, Black and Paul says, the article is profoundly revealing about the author more so than about travel dark, right? Dark. Um, you know, but I think that like, this article, it's one of those where, uh, right, I mean, maybe this is what they're going for in The New Yorker. You know, it's like the article about like, you're using your refrigerator wrong or something like that. You know, that's just be like, what do you mean I'm using my refrigerator wrong? I was like, one of these viral stories that went around recently is um, ketchup, you're doing it wrong. You know, ketchup should be refrigerated. Heinz went on the record and said, ketchup should be refrigerated. And on the local news, there was a whole bit about, ketchup should be refrigerated. Some people are doing it wrong. Uh, Emmett said, did the article mention time and money? These are two main things traveler sacrifices. The article talked nothing about time and money. Uh, and yes, it costs a lot of money and it costs a lot of time to travel. Those are the things we trade uh, to do it. Uh, and Laura says, we're only on this planet for a limited time. Why not explore it? That is a fantastic question. Uh, all right, let's go to Q&A time. Fellow explorers, it is now Q&A time. If you've got a question, I've got an answer. We already did Q&A time. Let's go to giveaway time. Yes, it's the time you've been waiting for. It's time for the giveaway. See these buttons for Q&A and giveaway? They're right next to each other. And so when I was looking at giveaway, Q&A got in my head and that's what we did. All right, fellow explorers, every video I give away a Yellow Productions Crew shirt to someone who can answer one of my questions. And my question to you is, the author of this essay visited a hospital in Abu Dhabi for a certain type of animal. What animal was that? And if you're the first person to put that in the chat, you will win a Yellow Productions Crew shirt. If you don't win, you can pick one up at the Yellow Productions shop. You'll find that uh, at the link right there or also in the description below. Uh, if you want to figure out how to support the channel and you don't want to buy a shirt, well, you can consider joining and becoming one of the fabulous Yellow Productions channel members, thanks to these people right here. And... Um, if you're wondering, Chris, when is the next live stream going to be? Why was this one on Monday? This was on Monday because tomorrow's July 4th, Independence Day in the USA. And I figured lots of people would be watching the fireworks instead of watching me. But you can sign up for the Yellow Productions update at update.yellow-productions.com. And now we have a winner, winner chicken dinner. 
All right, congratulations to FL. Uh, the correct answer was Falcons, indeed. Uh, and I wonder if the F in FL stands for Falcons. Uh, FL, congratulations, you win a shirt. Send me an email, you'll find it in the description of this video. Let me know your address and your size and I'll get it shipped right out to you. Daniel came in second place and Panjo came in third place. Well, fellow explorers, it's always a pleasure hanging out with y'all. And until next time, I won't say goodbye because I'll see you in the next video.